Hello, thank you very much for coming to this pre-show talk. Um, I'm Kate Bassett and I'm the literary associate here at Chichester Festival Theatre. Uh, and I'm delighted and intrigued and fascinated to be talking um, about the Deep Blue Sea this evening to the director, Paul Foster, whose CV, as you will see in the programme, is impressively long and varied, including wow. musicals and plays. So I wonder, could we start with a very basic question, which is how did you come to this play or how did this play come to you? Um, well, I grew up halfway between Manchester and Liverpool. Uh, if you're a rugby league fan, they're places like St Helens, Widnes, Warrington. <laughs> and um, uh, my, my library, which of course, you know, we need to hold on to them. The local library had, if people remember those Methuen editions, there was the Caretaker by Pinter, there was a Taste of Honey there, and there was the Deep Blue Sea. And we didn't have that many other plays. And I remember reading that when I was about, and Streetcar Named Desire, when I was about 16, 17. Um, and I loved The Deep Blue Sea when I read it. I thought it was the most wonderful, wonderful play. And I've not really gone overboard about what I'm going to say to you now, Kate, but I might as well say, well, I've got you here captive. Um, I was a year below Nancy Carroll at university. We went to university in Leeds and um, Nancy was going to apply for drama schools and she was looking at set speeches that she wanted to do. She was doing something for Richard III and Lettuce and Lovage and she wanted another speech. And I remember being in my bedsit in Leeds and I've recommended, there's a speech that Hester does in act two about love. We do it in this door frame and then not on this chair. And I remember there, Nancy just going through that. And I can't remember if she ever used it or not, but she got into all those drama schools and the rest, as they say, is her CV. Um, so it was about, we kind of had a conversation all those years ago about maybe coming together and doing this play. And um, we haven't worked together for 24 years. Were you directing at that point? We were, both student, we were both yeah. students. I was doing English and Spanish. She was doing fine art. Oh. And um, uh, we just did a student show together. We were both in oh, okay. it together. But we've, never, we've been friends, but we've never worked together in those years. But she, out of, ki out of loyalty, I suppose, she was offered to play Hester Collier about eight, nine years ago. And she declined, because I suppose we were on a promise. And her, which is very nice and very typical of her, but her CV, you know, is, speaks volumes. And um, I'm really thrilled that Daniel asked us to do it here because it, for those of you who've seen it or those of you who will see it, I think it gains hugely from being seen in an intimate mm. setting rather than a sprawling setting. In fact, um, we, I mean, I'm not going to mention social media much, but we had a lady who came on Saturday night, which was only our second preview, and saying how wonderful it felt to be in the room with them rather than distant and interplanetary from them. But that's Peter's design and Natasha's design and George's well, It's design. also kind of so appropriate, isn't it, for a, sli a slightly low-budget uh, flat. <laughs> you know, yes, you, yes, a small yes, space yes, feels yeah, right. Exactly, yeah. exactly. When the husband, um, I'm sure a lot of you know the play, but it's a, a woman who uh, leaves a marriage that she's found stultifying to be with a, an ex-RAF fighter pilot and all that the thrill and the thrall that he might offer her and the husband for various reasons in the first half the estranged husband comes through that door and comes in and you have to feel that he's come from Eaton Square in Belt Chelsea uh, and C Victoria and comes through here and this bombed out part of Labrook Grove and the disdain and the disbelief of why she's chosen this life path when he was offering her so much of worth and I think when you're doing that on a space of such acreage it's very hard for that to be conveyed. Whereas here, with just these tokenistic and emblematic things, it's very easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you obviously read Rattigan very early. Did, you, did that lead you on early to know lots about Rattigan and research? Or did, did this idea of working with Nancy Carroll lead you to do lots of extra research? That's or, a good or question. Not? Um, I'm, it wouldn't be my chosen specialised subject on Mastermind. I don't know all the plays. I know separate tables and a, a, a couple of others. So I'm not dying in the way. I read both the biographies of him. Right, yeah. uh, I've seen bits of footage of him. Uh, but I did a lot of work on that post-war 1945 to 1951. We've set this on September the 10th. 1951. So the music that's played from the wireless before that were all songs that were in circulation 1949, 1950, early 1951. There's a prop there which is Theatre World from two months before this is set, as if they're on a nice date, they've been to a theatre. That Wisden Almanac is from 1950 and he's a cricket fan. Um, there's a, the Festival of Britain was on on the South Bank. No one here is old enough to remember it, I'm sure. Um, but uh, a, a lady actually who was sat up there on Saturday said she was taken as a girl there and she recognised the pamphlet when Nancy turned through it. So it's, it, yeah. what, I, 
what I steeped myself in was the play and London and particularly Northwest London and rationing specifics from that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because I was, I was going to ask, did you, well, obviously the answer is intrinsically in this sense, uh, mm. yes. Did you try to be really historically accurate? And does that, does that extend to how people are moving and talking or are you also interested in freeing it up? I suppose I'm partly thinking about things like Noel Coward where in recent decades they've slightly liberated yeah. the cut glass yeah. accent or yeah. how did that work for you? We've done a little bit of that. I didn't see it, but how it, the late great Howard Davis directed a Private Lives with um, Alan Rickman and Lindsay Duncan about 18 years ago. And that was one of the first to free it a little bit from the cigarette holders and the clenched and the very, very high RP where we're talking about going camping. Um, and I, I think what we've done with this, I don't know, I'm just speaking very honestly and I, I don't, uh, I'm going to do that. Um, I think nowadays when we hear that very, very rarefied accent, that very high mm. RP, I don't think our sympathies and our empathy immediately goes towards that. I don't think so now, um, if it ever did. Um, and so... The, we have had a brilliant dialect coach to work through things and Freddie Page has to have a very particular RAF slang. So, so we watched the sound barrier that Rattigan scripted a, a six months around the time that he wrote this and we looked at some archive video. And whilst the accents are very delineated, they're not in that kind mm. of um, so French crisp. windows, 30s, yeah. 40s, uh, because you do, sometimes don't feel the blood coursing through their veins as much. Uh, but of course the challenge for doing one of these plays is I'm sure there'll be people in this audience that might have seen seven or eight or more Deep Blue Seas, it's been filmed twice. Um, and so the challenge for us to come and work on this new production is to make a case for it now in 2019 with these actors, with this creative team in this setting. And I don't think, but you'll be the, be you'll be the best judge, that it feels like a rehash. I, I hope it feels that it's something that's landed in our inboxes or through our letterbox rather than just dust the cobwebs off and it's preserved in aspic. Her Hester Collier is hugely different to anyone I've seen before play it. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I was just thinking about my, th this was the 60s, but when I was a kid, um, I remember can't my mum, my oh, it, it was, oh, it so it was. No. My, my mum had two accents. My yes. mum had a phone accent. Mm. So mm. she went much more Noel Coward yes. when she answered the phone. Yes. Which was kind of, <laughs> all yeah. the children would be going, what's happened to mum? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there's three phone calls in that three, so you can judge, yeah. <laughs> yes. Didn't mean, I didn't mean well, to point out whether an idea there. I don't think Hester needs to be doing well. that. Um, I, uh, generally about Rattigan or specifically about this play, what do you think is powerful for you or generally about him sociologically? So I suppose I mean about the era, what he's saying about the era or about women or about class or about, or about human relations more timelessly? I think it's the most... It's funny, when we were working on it, sometimes, and I have a background in musicals, although musicals like plays, you have good ones, you have bad ones, of course you do. Sometimes you're responsible for tr to try and gussy up a piece of text that isn't really that robust. Working on this, it's the most exquisite writing. What you can say, what you can say in person against what's going on underneath and the two things, and that's very English almost in a way, isn't it? But what I find so moving about the play is what he knows about the human heart. Mm -hmm. It's, um, again, I don't know how many of you have seen it, we've only done a couple of shows, but to watch, I've been sitting in various places, in act three, so this section after the interval, um, people openly weeping, op men, women, all ages, openly sobbing, reaching for hankies, asking the person in front. And that's the play, it's not us. It, we, I think good, direct, good working on a play is like a brass rubbing. It's just letting it come up rather than, I've got the most wonderful idea, let's set it on a beach, or let's give her a limp, or let's make, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's only what's there in the play. So it's the human heart, it's the humour used, the gallows humour of the play, uh, it's the near misses of the play, and if, you meant so many of us have had our hearts broken. Uh, and I think the play looks very long and hard about how difficult it is to love fully mm -hmm. and honestly. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? A pairing with plenty, actually, in that it's a, it's a mid 20th century play about yes. a woman who is in a relationship that yes. then in, in the end walks out. It's yes. kind of not able to love someone who, who loves her yes. more, actually. Yes, yeah. and, it, and it's this thing, isn't it, that 
again, I, I don't want to do spoiler alerts on it, but it's that difficulty of a seesaw of a relationship to be wholly balanced. Mm. And when somebody loves somebody more or is more passionate, I think, I think there's an interesting thing going on, hopefully, in this production of the depiction of Freddie Page, who's the male lead in the play. Um, there was a lady, I won't, I won't angle towards her, but she's here, uh, who was um, brilliant about the play and said she's seen it four or five times and she's never seen a Freddie Page that she likes or that she, you know. And, and I think in this production, and this is a mark of Hadley Fraser and is such a brilliant actor, is I think that Hadley shows you that character in the round, the character who, for whom the Second World War and all the uh, hijinks of it and the heroic, the heroism of it, to then be on Civvy Street six years later, not finding anywhere to plug into, I think, I think he plays that beautifully, the idea that um, uh, he just can't quite articulate it and you can be casually cruel to the person that you love the most. You know. I was also thinking when I saw, I saw a preview of it, and I, I was very interested by the idea that the, sort of that about Freddie, that previously I thought he just totally doesn't mm. love anyone. It's really. his tragedy too, I think. But in a way, I think he's sort mm. of inarticulate, mm. and it's he's more interestingly complex mm. in that this, you know, that people love to different degrees mm. and don't know they do, and and it's very rounded on that level. Mm. It's not sort of black and white in terms of I his, hope so. Yeah, yeah. I hope yeah. so. And and it, you know when you've got a character like Hester, it can be. I mean, I don't think this about this particular play, but sometimes these plays can be directed as vehicles, and so you've got this wonderful central park, and everyone else are just nine pins around them. But I think this cast, and I have to praise Charlotte Cut Sutton, who's our casting director, the eight strong cast we would be the worst play without one fleck of that tapestry mm. that they do. And you know, uh, some of the, they play it almost as if they've got another scene that you've witnessed because they flesh out. So I'm, I'm proudest of the fact that it feels like a canvas of eight post-war characters rather than this incredible Hello Dolly role and everyone else frames her beautifully. Yeah, yeah. I was actually, that slightly takes us on to, I, I wanted to ask you, so sort of socially, I asked mm. you about why, why Rattigan's interesting. Artistically, because the program the program talks about his his neat structures and his kind of amazing choreography of space yeah. and and I wondered if if that were true because I was thinking about that and I was thinking it's mm. interesting, isn't it, that in some ways there are lovely symmetries about yes. who comes in once or twice yes. or more than that or who yeah. frames the play. Yes. Is that something that you delight in? Is it is it easy to deal with that or does that do you also have to loosen that up at all for a That's a good question again. I think um, one of the things is sometimes, because I suppose with Binky Beaumont, who was the original impresario that, that um, presented this play in 1952, uh, and he'd gone through at least six drafts, and they're all in the British Library, the, the, the drafts and the incarnations that it went through, there's a, a little bit of a challenge, which is, when, when the key moment of the scene has been reached, a door is opened or a door knocks. And it can feel a little bit wrapped at Fortnum and Mason, if that makes sense. It can feel very neat. And so you just have, well not have yeah. to, we've chosen to muddy that slightly. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a shame that somebody can be pilloried for being a brilliant craftsperson, isn't it? Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. You'd never go and have a wardrobe made and think, oh gosh, this is wonderful, it fits all my clothes. It's you know, interesting people say that about Arthur Miller as well, because yeah, yeah. he was a carpenter and yes. people go, they're sort of strongly carpented. Yeah. And that is true. That is true. And in some ways that's her strength. Yeah. And some, sometimes it isn't. Yes. But, I, think, yeah. I think this is his, uh, I th well, it's a claim to be, I think it's his greatest play. Mm. It's so profound. It makes its points with great subtlety. It doesn't go, it doesn't hammer away. I mean, you're, it's some, some of it is so heartrending, but it's not that kind of... It's because of what's unsaid and what's buried rather than what's made overt and explicit. Yeah. And actually, to me, when I watch it, it doesn't feel like a tightly structured play. It feels like a boarding house where people are... Uh, yeah. what, yeah. you know, there's almost a wanderingness yeah. to it. And I think uh, it's a real microcosm of early 50s society, isn't mm. it? How people can be outsiders, how, how fortunes can change so quickly. Uh, it's very... Um, we have a lighting effect. Uh, so there's upstairs of the windows, this is the first floor of at least a two bedroom, a two floor, three floor rooming house in Labrook Grove. So people, I'll just open this door for you. We've no light on it at the moment, but this goes down, that goes downstairs. Um, and there's obviously a porch downstairs. And then there's this off here that goes upstairs. There's a, there's a massive argument in act two, Freddie and uh, Hester having one of their flamers, Rattigan calls it. 
And we've just, suddenly, we've just put on one of those lights. And I'm not referring to the political events of this weekend, <laughs> but, you know, that idea of people with tumblers up against a wall. Um, it, it, I remember it from my grandmother. My grandmother was born in 1911, and she spent a lot of her life fearing what people might think, mm. what her reputation would be, the shame. That's in this play hugely. Um, if you transgress from the social box that you should be in, how flayed you are, how judged you are for that. And um, there's a line that uh, Miller says in Act Three where he says, voices carry on the stairs. You know, that, 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 that how much we were blighted, loose tongues cost lives. I actually wanted to talk to you a little bit more about the directing process right from the start. Mm. Could you just tell us a bit about, I mean, obviously I imagine you didn't audition Nancy. No, you I should have done, but shouldn't how, I? How, yeah. how does, I wouldn't be in this fix if in, I didn't, no. in, <laughs> in general, yeah. how does the audition process work or, or I mean, yeah. one imagines people queuing outside and turning up with a set speech, yeah. but is it like that in reality? So for this, I can only, sp I'll speak for this production specifically. So there's eight roles and from memory, I think three of them, yes, I think three of them were what's called offer. We offered them. So we thought an actor or an actress of a particular caliber and we thought this would be a good fit for him or her. And so you put that offer out and then you see how that goes and you move on or you, you, you get those accepted. So there were five other roles and Charlotte and I got together and talked about the play and we talked about the kind of actor or actress and how that what that would bring something to that uh, and then we met I think we did two and a half days of casting in London and so they would come in and read the particular pages that have been identified for the audition and you get a good few days with those and then the slots are 20 25 minutes something like that and so Charlotte would read the other character and the actor auditioning would read uh, the, the set character and then I would hear it and I go okay what about if we play that a little bit more glibly or let's try if we can flick through that. Why do you think? And then they'd go again. Mm -hmm. And in that process, you can see whether you have a rapport and an elasticity with that actor. It's very clear. And what I do uh, is I always, this sounds like any basic human thing, but I used to act. Um, and sometimes in a process, you just read the text and you don't have any interpersonal Right. dialogue oh, at all right. across the table mm -hmm. and I'd like to speak for three or four minutes about their journey or something to do with it because in that time I can tell I think whether that person's going to want to be in a room and to be part of a company and to be collaborative or whether they want to be stiff or distant or a bit egotistical uh, because you know you're making a company that's going to last for two and a half months so if somebody's not going to get on with Who that... Who don't know each other at yeah, the start. Yeah. If somebody doesn't feel biddable for that, it's not going to be pleasant for him or her and for everybody else. So I think we're on duty bound to try and make sure that nice and good. And then I wondered about the other sort of pre-rehearsal bit. Yeah. So I, I particularly wondered about the design process mm. and, and how that works as a timeline, yeah. how you decide not just the set designer but you know presumably often the costume and set designer yes, is the yes. same but the lighting designer is the same. Right. how do you how do you or they get their teams together and are the are the sort of time stages before yeah. rehearsals begin yeah. and do you keep do you change your mind a lot or uh, well uh, usually we're driven to a white card which as it as you'd imagine you you make the set in white card and it's uh, 25 uh ratio down from the full size so you can work out where you might have a wall where you might have a window where you might if you're going to do a rake or something and then there's a final model box which is usually about 12 weeks before uh, the production goes into rehearsal and that's with everything painted realized fully again in a maquette size so peter mcintosh who's our brilliant designer we must have met about four times to talk through the play first time just we both read it across a table what do we think what do we not think and then in the each of the subsequent meetings more would become suggested more would be live and visible for us so we both wanted the idea I think the worst thing you could say about the production of a play is, well, it would have been as good on the radio. So you have to have something visual and the performances, as you say, the costume, the hair um, and the props that make it live vibrantly for that audience at that time. So we hit on the idea that, you know, six years after the First World War, Labrook uh, Grove was still slum clearance. And so you'll see that the set is founded on wreckage. So there's pram handles, there's chair backs, there's spokes, there's an airfix aeroplane, there's a missile 
a holy missile because, of course, she was very religious with her father and she, she kind of stepped away from being a clergyman's daughter in many ways. So it also means that it gives the audience the sense that there's a life outside these walls and how recent that uh, war and its experience has uh, affected and stymied these characters. And then we wanted to give the idea of height in the Minerva. We could just as easily have done the set without the upstairs, but we liked the idea of the voyeurism that that would be. And then you want it to be as realistic as possible. And in our production, we wanted to very much suggest that Hester was a talented artist. And so Nancy and Peter and the props people had a very early meeting to say what kind of painter she would be at 17 and how naive that might be, and then what her later style would be. So that otherwise you're not going around antiques markets and just throwing in anything in. So that she feels totally bound into that. As, and so on the picture from 17, which has been worked on at the moment, we invented a maiden name for her. And, and that's signed in the corner. Now, Joe Public can't necessarily see any of those things, but the actors who have to make it fresh throughout the run feel on much firmer ground to have actuals, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yesterday I noticed that there was a New Testament on the set for set dressing, and I thought, I don't think that she would have that faith at all. So just because I'm trying to get out of the theatre slowly in the interval, I noticed it there. So, of course, that's been changed now. So you're yeah. always trying to make it as if not naturalistic, realistic as possible. Yeah. Um, but you're in the room as much as we are. And presumably the actors like that as well, that there's a sort of, there's a real, very real, tangible objects that are their past. A hundred percent. And this gas fire, for those of you that know the play and the workings of that, you know, and the cash box and um, uh, the, the, the way that the rings happened on the telephone and the cradle being picked up. I mean, I'm all for experimentation and the play is robust enough to take that. But I think me setting this in the 80s in Melbourne wouldn't have helped yeah. hugely about it, you know, because, you know, let me give you one example. Um, there's a brilliant programme essay which refers to some of the sociolog uh, sociological things in place and that rationing was in place and actually worse in the immediate post-war years. And so... Freddie has forgotten her birthday. The play starts, as you know, with a suicide bid. Uh, and for various reasons, Hester's made an attempt on her life. This is on the first page. I really am not spoiling anything. And later on, uh, he comes back, Freddie. He's been playing golf over the weekend. And he says, oh, and he realises he's forgotten her birthday and would have got her some cigarettes if the shop was open as a gift. And um, he says, you didn't do anything special for dinner, did you? And she says, no, steak and a bottle of claret. Now, of course, that would have had to have been achieved on the black market at that time. So actually, your research shows you the heft of the line. Yeah. But there's no you know, footnote yeah, saying this is important that, because... Yeah. But you, the, the research can be your friend, I think. Yeah. And then once you're up and running, mm. how... I mean, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by whether your, your experience as an actor also feeds into that. You know, do you, it does, maybe it doesn't. It may, it may well do, yes. But... Yeah. but Getting it up on its feet, mm. I was just interested again by the the program talking about indoors and outdoors. Yeah. Is it how how do you go through that process? Do you do you do table reading? It depends. It, yeah. For me, it depends project to project. I was very lucky a few years ago to work with I think our greatest director Marianne Elliott uh, as an assistant director to her on a production. And if I didn't know this before, I certainly learned it after working with Marianne to prepare, to prep, to prep, to prep, so that you can throw it all out if you want to. But when the actor turns to you and says, I've got a question, for you to be absolutely clueless about it when you've only got a four week rehearsal period, uh, you know, you can wear it lightly and the actors are absolutely free to collaborate. So I did a lot of preparation for it in that. What was your question again? Oh, about move And the thrust. So of course it's written for a Pross Arch stage, the Duchess Theatre near the Aldwych where this was premiered is a prosage, you would be looking end on. And we knew that Daniel had programmed it for the Minerva so that we knew that the audience would be sat three on three sides. So of course, I've worked, been very grateful to work at the Sheffield Crucible a few times, which is this on a bigger scale, 900 seats on three sides. So we did do some table work and we do, did do some research, but sometimes you can only try the ideas out on their feet rather than who's, who's most academic in this company. Who's yeah. got, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it can yeah. feel very um, like you do a dissertation on the play rather than you do the play sometimes. Uh, and so we knew that we wanted to make sure that a person sat there had as good an experience as sat there. And that is doable if you keep it moving. Yeah. So if, if you've had Hester on this side or Sir William on this side, 
in the in the pages subsequently, I know that I want to make sure that he's available here and here. Mm -hmm. And because I grew up near Manchester, the Royal Exchange was my home mm -hmm. theatre. Yeah. And so you're very used to watching acting with your back, you know, so totally that you can be round, very yeah. eloquent, totally yeah. in the round. So, one of the reasons we wanted it on its feet quite early is because it felt that we could pace things like that, but also because we were mindful of trying to make sure that the 270 degreesness of the audience, they had as good an experience. I feel that's what our job is. Yeah. I, I'm just looking at my watch. I think we better wrap up um, for the actors to prepare, etc. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much okay. to Paul for giving up your time. <laughs> <laughs>